This week we're studying Parashat Re'eh. Um, I would like to thank tonight's sponsors. We have one sponsor, my parents, my mother's on, um, who are sponsoring tonight's class in honor of my wife Sarah's birthday. Big mazal tov. Thank you, mom and dad. Thank you all for joining. May this class be a big merit for my parents for sponsoring and Bezrat Hashem also for my wife to uh, Bezrat Hashem have the continued strength to take care of our kids, of the women in the community, of uh, her parents, of me a little bit, but of, uh, of, every, of everyone that she's here for. And uh, thank you, thank you very much. Okay, tonight's class, as I started off in the intro, uh, before we actually started the class, um, we're going to speak about a topic tonight that both the Zer Shimshon and Reb Leib both address. And they both address it not in such a lengthy manner. So we're going to combine. Tonight, we're doing one class. Tonight's a unity class. We're going to have the, together, we're going to have the Zer Shimshon and Reb Leib combined, being that they're speaking on the same topic. So <clears throat> what is the topic we are speaking about this evening. So of course, the beginning of this week's Torah portion speaks about when the Jewish people are going to enter the land of Israel. And then right very, very soon after entering, they're to, supposed to have some type of blessing and curse ceremony. And this blessing and curse ceremony is supposed to happen very soon after entering in order to not really bless or curse the Jewish people, but more it's like a reminder right now after Moshe Rabbeinu passes away and, and, and uh, Joshua is leading the Jewish people into the land. They are to be reminded that if A, B, and C, well, then you'll be blessed. But if X, Y, and Z, and we could obviously fill in the blanks, then unfortunately they'll be cursed. Just as, as an introduction to this whole idea, a, a, a blessing is something that draws, it's basically, the, 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 the definition of a blessing is when you draw down blessing from God into whatever it is that you're doing. So if it's eating something, you're putting blessing. You are appreciating what you are being given by God. When your family is blessed, it's because God is present there and he is allowing amazing things to happen. The, the same is in with business, the same is with the school, the same is with the community, the same is with the couple, the same is with every single thing. Blessing is when you draw down and you infuse godliness into whatever it is that you are actually doing. The opposite is a curse. And the Torah goes on and on about this, that a curse is the absence of God. It's the absence of blessing. It's the absence of his, of his presence um, being in that very, very place. So that's what is a result of when someone eats without making a blessing. And when, unfortunately, a family, a business, a, uh, a community does not have God infused and involved, that is the definition of a curse. Moving after, right after that, the Torah goes and reminds, or Moses goes and reminds the Jewish people what the purpose of entering the land of Israel, it is to actually make a temple, to make the Bet HaMikdash. This Mishkan, this tabernacle that's been portable with them for the past 40 years, is only like a mini temple, a portable temple, but there is a physical permanent structure to be built. On that, the Torah goes on and on. I want to share with you just, just maybe a very few of them. Goes on and on to describing where this place is. So let's start off with Deuteronomy chapter 12, verse 11. It says, V'haya hamakom, and it's going to be when you, at the place, hamakom, the place that Hashem, Hashem, Yuvchar, Hashem, Elokechem, that God is going to choose, l'shaken shemo sham, to establish his name there. That's where you will bring all that I command you. Meaning burnt offerings, sacrificings, tithes, um, anything of the separation of the hand, anything that a person um, vows to give to God. That is going to be the place that is going to be the epicenter of where all service of God is going to take place, being that God's presence is going to reside there. Now, the question is, and Rebleib here, I'm going to show you a couple more verses. Rebleib says, look in, look in chapter 12, verse 5. Kiel hamakom, at the place that Hashem will choose, out of all of the shvatim, 
out of all of the encampments, the settlements, La Sumit Shemosham to place his name there, that is the Shikhnodi Tirashu Vatashama. That's where you will inquire after his dwelling and come there. So Let's take another one. Chapter 16, verse 16. Three times a year we have an obligation to come to the temple. Come, all, all of the males need to come. Again, women may not be able to. They may have just given birth. They may, they may be pregnant. They may not be able to, to come. But the males, all males need to come up to the temple. Women are definitely invited. Where? At the place that Hashem is going to choose on Pesach, Shavuot, and Sukkot, we have to come not empty-handed. So both the Zer Shimshon and Reb Leib are asking, the Torah this week mentions multiple times the temple and the place where sacrifices are going to be brought. We have to come for the holidays, where the service is going to take place. However, the Torah is repeatedly not mentioning the location of the Bet HaMikdash. It's just calling it the place, HaMakom. So both the Zer Shimshon and Reb Leib are asking, why is the Torah concealing the place of the temple over and over and over? It's a fair question, simple question. Let's start with the Zer Shimshon's answer. Zer Shimshon says that we see that it was not only hidden or being concealed at this point, it was actually concealed even later on in history, and that is even when King Saul and specifically King David were ruling or leading the nation. King David was approached by a Navi, the prophet, and the prophet told him, go and make the altar, go and, 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 and seek out where the temple actually is supposed to be, meaning that they didn't really know where it was. Comes the Zashim Shon and says, Hashem did not tell the Jewish people where the place of the Bet HaMikdash was until it was ready to be used, says the Zashim Shon. Prior to the place of the Bet HaMikdash needing to be used, there was no need for Hashem to say exactly where it would be because, explains the Zer Shimshon, that that location could be perceived by the Jewish people as an insult, being that it may just be a field, there may be animals there, it wasn't holy yet because it was not used for a holy purpose. The holy purpose of it, of being, of, of it, of obviously being the epicenter, the place where Hashem is going to reside. And therefore, since the land may be desolate and, and, and seemingly insulting, or, or insulting the Jewish people for this is the place where it's going to be, and now there's nothing there. For that reason, Hashem did not tell the Jewish people where the place was. Not King Saul and not King David till the end of his life, because he didn't even build it. At the, really, at the, at the end, it was really King Solomon who built the temple. Until that point, the temple location was not revealed because God was waiting for it to be needed not to insult the Jewish people of where it may be. So now we can understand, says the Zer Shimshad, when it comes to Abraham. Abraham was told also to go up to the mountain, a mountain, but really Rebbe brings this proof as well. Go to the place where I will show you. So you know what happens, at, and this was for the, this is for the um, Akedat Yitzchak, for when he was coming to bring the Akedah, when God um, commanded Abraham to sacrifice Isaac. At that point, after the fact, after Abraham was revealed to by an angel and told not to sacrifice his son. After that, read, read this verse. The verse says, the Zer Shimshon brings, here we go. Genesis chapter 22, verse 14. And then Abraham calls that place Hashem Yireh. The Lord will see. As it is said to this day on the mountain, the Lord, the Lord will be seen. Will be seen, asked the Zer Shimshon. Didn't Abraham just see him? He was just revealed to by God. So why is it that Hashem will see in the future, asks the Zer Shimshon. He comes and says, yes, even though Abraham now 
has got to that place. Now he understands the importance of this place. And he knows that this is the place where God will show the Jewish people at the right time in the future, the location of the temple. In, with his great amount of prophecy, he understood that this is the place where he will be shown where the temple will be. So this is what the Zer Shimshon gives, says over, beautiful answer. Before we move on to Reb I wanted to share a quick lesson on this. And this is obviously the lesson of the importance of timing in life. In life, there is a proper and improper time for everything. There's a time to laugh. There's a time to be sad. There's a time to be loud, so to say, and there's a time to be a little more quiet. There's a time to rejoice. There's a time to mourn. There are specific times in our life where we are to act a certain way. And Hashem is teaching us this as well. Sometimes it's not important to know all the information that is available. Because at a certain point, maybe too premature, it may be insulting, it may be unnecessary, it may be unwanted. The same way, we have to understand when is the time to talk, when is the time to be silent, when we are supposed to um, uh, ex uh, exert or use certain emotions over others, when we're supposed to share information, when we're not supposed to share information. Certain things are private, certain things are to be shared, certain things are to be shared to some people and not to others. But there is a time and place for everything. God is teaching us that there was a time for the place, Hamakom, to be known to the Jewish people. Because before that, not only is it unnecessary, it may even be insulting. Having said that, let's move on to Reb Leib's interpretation. And Reb Leib asks the exact same question. And that is, why is the Torah concealing the place of the temple why is moses not telling the jewish people where it is i mean he doesn't even get into this but did moses know where it was or not that's a, that's a question but whichever however we want to understand it moses definitely didn't tell the jewish people where it was and god did not reveal the place why is that so Rebbe brings three answers given by Rabbeinu Bechaye, one of the commentaries on the torah which are all based on the maimonides the rambam that right that he writes in more nevuchim he says as follows, first answer, to assure that the other nations will not know where the location of the temple is, God did not tell the Jewish people, Moses did not tell the Jewish people where the temple is so that they would not try to conquer it and hold it and, and not allow us to actually build a temple there. So that's his first answer. Second answer is also, so the nations would not find out. Again, if it's written in the Torah, if the Jews know where it is, it's very easy for the nations to find out. If the nations would find out where the place is, they may destroy that area so badly that it become unusable for the Jewish people. Another nice answer. Third answer the Rebbeinu B'chaya gives is that Hashem did not reveal to the Jewish people where the temple was until they had to build it, was in order that the tribes would not fight amongst themselves all claiming the temple's by me, the temple's in my portion, not in your portion, and maybe uh, a sense of arrogance uh, and haughtiness that one tribe may have over another. And for those reasons, Hashem did not uh, reveal to the Jewish people where the temple was going to be. Rebleib debunks all three of these. Very interesting. So the Rambam and Rebbein Abchayi were, were years, hundreds of years before, before Rebleib. Rebleib asks very simply, and he debunks all of these answers. For the first two answers that the nations should not know where it is so that they either don't conquer it or don't destroy that area, Rebleib in his humble, he says, in my humble opinion, I would say otherwise. In my humble opinion, he says, that the Jewish people could have just not shared the location, the future location of the temple with the nations of the world. And you may say hey, they won't be able to do that. Well, in the Talmud in Masechet Megillah, page 9b, there are, there's a story of the Greek king who mandated 70 Talmudic scholars, 70 rabbis, to translate the Torah into Greek. And by doing so, the, the king wanted to know, well, what's in this very famous book? And they all made a number of changes. I don't remember offhand how many exactly it was, but they all made the exact same number of changes 
to the translation of the Torah from Hebrew to Greek in order that the king would not see these questions and not understand or not accept certain answers. For example, um, one of the non-kosher animals is, I believe what the Talmud says, I haven't seen it in a little while, is an arnevet. An arnevet is a type of, a type of hare or a type of uh, bunny rabbit. And the king's mother's name was arnevet. If it wasn't that name, it was another name, but whatever it was. So the scholars all omitted that name from the list of non-kosher animals as not to insult the king and god forbid risk their lives very interesting another was obviously the beginning of the torah where it says bereshit bara elokim where in the beginning or bereshit created god we can't understand that something created god so they switched it around they said elokim bara bereshit so there there were a couple changes that they all made so Rebleib says they could have made this change also the sages could have also, or the rabbis, the Jews could have also not shared the future location of the temple with the nations. So he debunks the first two answers that were given by Rabbi Mechaia and the Rambam. He, he now, excuse me, he now debunks the third answer, the answer of the Jewish people not fighting over, well, whose portion is the temple really going to be in? Because the Talmud in Masechet Zvachim, page 118b, says that Hashem's presence was has resided in three places. In Shiloh, in a Mishkan, right? A, a tabernacle. Noven Giv'on, it's the second place. And the third time in the temple. And all three places the Talmud says were in the portion of Benjamin. And the Jewish people knew this. They always knew that Hashem would always reside his presence in the portion of, of Benjamin. So therefore, there's no reason for the Torah to leave it out right now, the location. What's the difference? The tribes knew exactly that it would always be in the portion of Benjamin. For that reason, the Zer Shimshon, not the Zer Shimshon, Reb Leib, sorry. Reb Leib now and gives his own answer. His own answer is based on a Midrash. It's a Sifri. It says as follows. The Sifri is analyzing the verse. I want to pull it up for you, even though I showed it to you before. The verse is in chapter 12, verse 5. The verse says, Ki im el ha-makom Hashem elokecha, the place that Hashem will choose, mikol shiftechem, of all of your tribes, lasum et shemosham, to place his name there, you shall inquire after his dwelling and come there. Those are very important words. You shall inquire after his dwelling and come there. Explains the Midrash. The Midrash says, we have an obligation based on the verse to go and seek the very place of the temple. But it obviously has to be based on the guidance of the Navi, of the prophet. Does that mean the Midrash says that we need to wait for the prophet to come and show us the place? No. The end of the verse says, the shikhnoti shama, you are to seek and inquire and find the place for yourself. Just as David did when he was searching for the place of the Beit HaMikdash. Once you find that place, then you have to, um, what's the word, confirm the place with the, with, the, with the Navi, with the prophet. But you need to, the Jewish people has to go out and seek it and find it themselves. Explains Reb Leib. There seems to be a very, very important point over here with the reason why the Torah is omitting the location of the temple. And that is because we have to use our efforts as the Jews to go and find that place of the temple for ourselves. Moses was not telling the people where it was. Because God wanted them to exert their energy to search for it, almost like a treasure hunt. It was the duty of B'nai Israel to find that location after entering the land of Israel. Only after that can they confirm, or Hashem will confirm, that they actually found it. Now, Reb Leib goes to prove this concept. This is a very, 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 very beautiful concept. Reb Leib says, let's prove that Hashem really does work with this method of finding him, this is the way he operates. Number one, at the end of the eight days of the inauguration of the tabernacle, 
there's a mysterious verse in the Torah. Take a look. Leviticus chapter 9, verse 6. It says, Vayam and Moshe, and Moses said, this is the thing that the God commanded. And the glory of Hashem will appear to you. Rebleib says there is a very, very difficult debate amongst the Torah commentaries with this word hadavar, the thing. This is the thing the Lord commanded. What did Hashem really command the Jewish people to do at that point? So Rebleib Answers with the Orachaim HaKadosh. The Orachaim says that Hashem wanted the Jewish people to understand during the inauguration of the temple, of the, of the tabernacle rather, he wanted the Jewish people to understand that they are in front of God. And one doesn't act the same way as they normally do in front of a king and all the more so in front of the king of kings, Hashem himself. Once Moshe Rabbeinu understood that Hashem is commanding the Jewish people for, for them to know, to have in mind constantly that Hashem is there all the time. As King David said, Hashem tamid, that a person should always place Hashem opposite them, in front of them, with them at all times. Then Hashem appeared. Then vira kvod Hashem. Then the honor of Hashem appeared. It took the Jewish people eight days to understand how important it is to realize that they are in front of God at all times. And the same way as here in the tabernacle, you see God and he's in your mind. You take him with you everywhere you go. So from there we see, says, says Rebleib, that we have an obligation to seek out Hashem. He may re- very well right be there, but we need to acknowledge it. Furthermore, second proof, Jacob slept in a place on his way, escaping from his brother, on his way to his uncle Lavan's house. He slept in the place and he had a dream. with The angels going up and down. And he understood that the place that he was only after the fact was extremely holy. He didn't know where he was until he got up. Look at the verse, the verse in Genesis chapter 28, verse 16. It says, He wakes up from his dream. And he says, Whoa, indeed, Hashem is here in this place. I didn't even know. He did not even know where he was. Asks Rableib, how didn't Jacob know where he was? Abraham and Isaac both were at that place for the for the Akedah, for the for the slaughtering, the attempted slaughter of Isaac. They knew where it was, but they never told him where it was. Rableib says, You know why Abraham and Isaac never told Jacob where it was? Where the place was, the place of where the temple's gonna be? Is because Jacob had to find it for himself interesting he had to find it for himself and have a prophecy confirming that he is at that place even though his father and his grandfather knew where it was another proof by the way in that verse also it's not referred to as anything except for ha makom the place <laughs> just like it is now in our torah portion and just like it is but for 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 uh, for for jacob when he's going to take a nap going to take his sleep over there Third proof, where by the way, the word hamakom, the place is used again, referring to the very same place, the place where the temple is going to be, is when God commands Abraham to take Isaac to offer him. Hashem tells him, take a look at your screen, chapter 22, verse 2. Let me show it to you. Here we go. Genesis 22, 2. Vayomer, God tells it, Abraham, take your only son, Asher to the one you love, Isaac, and go to Eretz HaMoriah. The land of Moriah, and take him up as a burnt offering, al ahad harim on a mountain that I'll that I will tell you, on a mountain that I'll tell you where it is. Why why can't you just tell him where it's going to be? Explains Reb Leib. Rashi he rarely brings Rashi. Rashi says that Hashem wanted to give Abraham even more merit in seeking out. And finding the place, Hamakom, the place where Hashem resides his presence, the place where the world was created from, the place where 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 uh, 
Abraham brings Isaac, the place where Jacob takes takes a nap from, the place where the temple is going to be built, that place, Abraham, God wanted Abraham to find that place for himself. So Rebbeim says the lesson is very clear over here. The lesson is that the reason, the way Hashem operates is that he wants our patriarchs, Moses, the Jewish people, all to seek out and find him. The place is more than just the place. It's him. It's his presence. He wants them. God wants all of them, including us, to seek out him, to seek out God. And I'll take this a step further. The same way that we all have to forge a relationship with our creator, our children do as well. The same way, like no one's going to have it forged for us, no matter what type of school you went to as a child, no matter where you were born or who your parents and grandparents are, no matter how connected or disconnected, knowledgeable or unknowledgeable your parents and grandparents were, it doesn't matter. Every single Jew has the obligation to seek out and find God to the best of your ability. Now, how do we do that? Rabbi, amazing. How do we do that? The way to do that is by living your life the way he, Hashem, guided us to. By studying the greatest gift he ever gave to mankind, which is the Torah. This is the only way. Nobody can spoon feed it to you. Nobody can give it to you as an inheritance. The Torah and our relationship with God is not something that is just automatic. If unfortunately becomes automatic and robotic, it is so easy for it to just vanish. It's something that we need to keep on working on that relationship with God, we have an obligation according to the Torah. It seems like the way it's not just for us, it's for every single Jew, so all dating back to our patriarchs. We have an obligation to go seek out, find Hashem, find the way he acts in our nature, in the in the world we, we live in, in science, through through divine wisdom, through the human body, through the way our brains and our emotions work. All of these things are ways that we are to study, to get closer in forging Hashem's relation, relationship with Hashem. Now we do know, yes, we know where the temple is. We know where the temple is supposed to be. We know where the first and second temple were. And right now, where the Dome of the Rock sits is where the third temple is to be built. We know that place. Physically, we know exactly where it is. Spiritually, we all need to find our way back there. Every single Jew. You can't do it for anyone else and no one can do it for you. We need to do it for ourselves. We can encourage and inspire others, help educate and teach others. But at the end of the day, your children are going to have to make their own choice. Your grandchildren are going to have to make their own choice. Your great-grandchildren are going to have to make their own choice. We can pave the way, but all we can do is show them which way to walk down, which path to take. They're going to have to take it for themselves. We can try and we should try to inspire and to encourage them. But every single Jew, without exception, needs to make that decision to seek out, look for, find God, and forge that relationship personally. We may think that, oh, this is like, why is this the system? A question that was asked in the chat, were both temples located in the very same location? Answer is yes. And the third is to be built there. There were minor differences in the uh, in the building plans because the second one was like rebuilt, but but in general they were they were in the exact same place, almost very very they're very very similar. Having said that, every so why is this the system? Why is the system that every Jew has to seek it out themselves? Why couldn't Hashem just make it you know more obvious? Again, we all have free will. We have this constant battle within us to make the right decision or not make the right decision. We are going to receive reward and merit, some in this world, but most in the world to come. Remember, we spoke about that last week. But we all have a choice, and part of our choice is finding God, seeking him out, and then connecting to him. It's a process. And this process is the way that Hashem intended because you cannot force someone to love you just like Hashem cannot force us to love Him. Even though we have a commandment to love Hashem, but it can't just be almost blind love because that 
comes and goes. We have an obligation to nurture, to foster this relationship we have with God, to invest in it so that like any other relationship, we truly love the other. In this case, it's us loving Hashem. So for us to do that, we need to make that own decision ourselves. We need to seek out God. We need to find God. So as a summary, the question we asked this evening on this week's Torah portion is why is the place of the temple not being mentioned? It's being concealed over and over again in our Torah. This week when Moses is commanding the Jewish people to go and, pre- and build the temple, when it comes to Jacob, when it comes to Abraham, when it comes to King David even, no one really knew where the place was. At the end of David's life, he was he found the place and he knew where it was. So according to the Zer Shimshon, it's because Hashem did not want to tell the Jewish people prematurely where it would be because it would hurt them that the place is being so um, disregarded and insulted. According to, well, we had three alternative answers that were believed brought from Rabbeinu Bechaye. Two of them so the nations don't know. One of them so the Jewish people won't fight over the place. But the main answer Blade gave is that we see from here, the conclusion is that we have an obligation to go and find that place for ourselves. The Jewish people had an obligation to find that place. Now they found it. We have an obligation to spiritually reconnect to that place. I want everyone to have a great rest of the week. It is still very early in the week. So much more Torah study to, to, to learn and to prepare for this week and may we all be be blessed in the marriage of Shimshon and Rav Haman that we will all find that place in our souls that connects to God since it is a piece of God himself recharge reconnect foster that relationship and grow with it and my only advice is through the study of Torah and fulfilling the mitzvot doing good deeds that having that great feeling of doing something good because you know it's good, because you know it's what God wants from you, whether it's to a fellow or it's between you and Hashem, and just studying Torah, studying more and more and more. The more we study, the more we learn. I mean, uh, just on a side note, I know we were ending quite, quite early this morning. On a side note, my mother and I were discussing something last week, Thursday, Friday, I was learning with my Chavruta, fascinating insight something which you may have thought you would have only found in a, in, in, in a modern psychology book, yet from 800 years ago, this rabbi said that point in an even very stronger, stronger way. So there's just nonstop, nonstop, nonstop. My, my, the, my, my point is, is just keep on reading, keep on learning, attend classes online, in person, read more, have proper guidance, and you will forge that very own and personal relationship you, your neshama, has with Hashem.